China has long been a major moneymaker for the movie industry, but as the country gets stricter with its censorship rules, film studios are starting to push back. Joining us to discuss this phenomenon is our very own Alexandra Canal, as well as Chris Fenton, movie producer and author of Feeding the Dragon. So, Chris, great to have you on the show. In terms of the sort of changes that we've seen in China's movie market, at one point they were opening up more to foreign movies, but where do things stand now? Well, it's interesting. I mean, back in say 2012 to 2016, uh, China was the golden goose that Hollywood looked to to really recoup some big investment dollars um, and the huge capital that it takes to make these big franchises. But cut to roughly 2018, 2019, we really started to see that market turn away from us. And today, the market is now projected as a zero for a lot of movies coming out of Hollywood when the bean counters get together and try to figure out what they're thinking that revenue is going to be from that big market. But Chris, is that not necessarily a bad thing? I mean, if you look at Top Gun Maverick, that film did not debut in China, grossed $1.5 billion worldwide. Spider-Man, No Way Home, another film banned in China, grossed $1.9 billion globally. Is this a sign that the U.S. doesn't need to rely on China as much as they previously thought? And could this be the beginning of a Hollywood without China? Oh, you're speaking my language. I am a big free speech advocate, and I love the fact that Hollywood was really built on the principles of protecting free speech and freedom of creativity of the filmmakers that make these great movies and bring these stories to life. So the fact that China now is not as important to Hollywood is a fantastic thing for the creative expression of these filmmakers. Yes, we can still make movies without brand integrating China or China propaganda or narrative into them. And if they're relevant, if they're universal in tone, there will be consumer markets there for future movies. But right now, we don't have to placate Beijing with every single movie that we make. And Chris, as a production executive, you were largely responsible for bringing a lot of movies from America into China. I'm curious what that censorship pro uh, process was like and how has it shifted over the years? Has China become more and more aggressive in its demands? Well, it's a great question. In fact, it does take a village to bring these movies into China. So I'm not the only one. I'm a cog in the wheel there. But when you look at the way it was starting to open, say, post the Summer Olympics in 2008, it really looked promising that the aspirational quality of democracy was starting to spread inside of that communist country. And when Hu Jintao gave power over to Xi Jinping and Xi Jinping started his rule, there was a start of this outward spread in the this openness to bring in more content from the West. But since 2016, 2017, we really started to see that outward expression of, hey, we want more of what you're making, Hollywood, start to collapse. And today, it's probably the worst I've ever seen in my career. And when you look at the correlation of a number of events, obviously you have China's COVID lockdowns, a slower economy, political tensions, and then obviously a lot of producers saying, look, I don't want to change certain aspects of my movies. Do you think that's going to be the future? Or do you think at some point there'll be other markets that may also be more attractive for U.S. producers and U.S. movies? Well, let's face it. I mean, there's 1.4 billion people in China. That's a huge market and 600 million of them plus are in the middle class there. So that is a lot of dollars that could be chasing this type of content. But with China closing off and with the tension between the U.S. and China continuing to increase, we got to start looking elsewhere. India is obviously a huge potential market. It's been very tricky to get in there, but it's a huge consumer uh, market that is really starting to spark to Western content. So if we can crack that market along with a lot of the Latin American markets and some of Africa, we really are going to start moving forward in a very strong momentum towards developing the monetization of this great content that Hollywood generates. And Chris, how much of a role did the pandemic and the fallout from COVID in particular play when we think about this uncoupling between Hollywood and China? Did the pandemic really accelerate the, these shifts in attitude? 
Well, the pandemic actually accelerated tech disruption and the ability to monetize this huge form of content. About 100 assets of this is made a year from the major studios. And technology has allowed the efficiency of monetizing it around the world to get extremely developed and much better. Um, you could be platform agnostic as far as somebody that's investing in these large scale movies, because it really doesn't matter if they're released theatrically or whether whether they go straight to streaming. So COVID really accelerated that aspect. And that's what really started to make China a little uh, marginalized as far as, as far as its influence on Hollywood. And it's continuing to move that way. And I see that as a very promising sign. And I want to ask you about the types of movies that do tend to do well. Obviously, culturally, everybody's different. We know that Chinese markets don't tend to like horror movies and things like that. So that's really not the market that you want to go to. What are some of the cultural aspects that do make U.S. movies more appealing in China? Well, obviously, I mean, the Chinese, 1.4 billion of them are very much like anybody else around the world. They love great storytelling. So if there's something universal in, in concept and the characters are relatable, they're going to go to the theaters to see it. Now, they actually have much more relevant content created by their own domestic industry there. So something really has to pop out if it comes from the outside. So that's why we see a lot of the big franchises and the big intellectual property, the stuff that comes from like a Disney or a Fast and Furious or a Spider-Man, those tended to be the ones that they would migrate to because the smaller films, they're going to see their own domestic industry really cater to them better than the West. So we really need to get big, explosive, big scale, $200 million plus budgets in order to penetrate that market effectively.